It is a good number. I think even with the down revisions to June and July, this was a solid number. The composition of the number was also good with professional hires up and professional hires dominated by full-time hires instead of temporary hires. Real change from not only earlier in this expansion, but what we saw in the 1990s. And I think that's really a return finally of people offering benefits to new hires and new grads as well. And it helped to buoy some of those wage numbers too, because those are high paying jobs. We also saw strong gains in health care. We're expecting that and strong gains in transportation warehousing. The one thing I would point out was the little bit of bad news or the one weak spot was manufacturing and that's where we're hearing from a lot of our clients that although their back orders are good, they're feeling good about their business, there is a bit of a hesitancy out there to hire right now and to go forward with investment plans because of uncertainties due to trade tensions and escalating trade tensions with China. Yeah, uh, manufacturing, I think, down 3K. Uh, David, does that continue? I guess it depends on how some of these talks uh, pan out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, in fact, this is a, a bigger problem around the world, is there is uncertainty caused by tariffs. So the biggest tax caused by tariffs right now is the uncertainty on global manufacturing. Yes. But I, I was actually a little underwhelmed by this report, uh, particularly on the household survey. You saw this big drop in labor force. So now labor force is only up 7 tenths of a percent year over year. So if you take the unemployment rate out to another decimal, it is actually still drifting down. And it, look, it looks like we are really running out of workers. And we're almost at the point here where I think a lack of workers is actually going to slow the economy on its own. Um, you know, if, if you can't find a builder, you're not going to build a house. If you, uh, if you can't find somebody to mow your lawn, maybe the grass grows longer. And I think the, that lack of labor supply is actually one of the drag factors on the U.S. economy at, at this point. So, you know, I, th I think we, we, we're, it's a good, uh, I think we've got good momentum right now, but I do see some slowing down. We see it in GDP in the third quarter, which I think will be about 2%. Uh, I'm, I'm not that excited about this number this morning on uh, overall on jobs. Diane, you know, do you I share like David's fear? Do you share David's fears in terms of uh, worker availability? I am concerned, and we are hearing it as well from many of the clients that we're dealing with, that they just can't hire up. And because they can't hire up, they're actually foregoing some business, which is exactly what David's talking about. I will note the biggest um, decline in labor force participation was a little bit of a glitch on the seasonals because the biggest decline came in teens. And so we always have a hard time timing when they go back to school. They're going back to school sooner than they did. 16 to 19 year olds was where the biggest drop off was. But we do face that upward hill of we're going to have to retain more retirees, the aging demographics out there. We don't have immigration. We're cutting that. And without those things, we could see as soon as 2020 a contraction in the labor force. And those are the things that David is pointing to. I'm looking at 3% growth in the third quarter, which is still good, but it is a slowing from the 4.2% or so that we saw in the second quarter. I think the most important issue is these the tax of uncertainty that David talks about as well. And how much are we seeing gains to get today at the expense of gains down the road? Because some of what we're seeing in terms of tariffs is also what I'm hearing in the manufacturing sector, people stockpiling ahead of their fears on tariffs at some point in time that stockpiling has to end. Right. David, uh, two year, two seven now. Did today's number do anything to alter the, the dot plot? Um, no, I, I still think the Fed's going to do two more times this year and two more times next year. I, I, I know there's a lot of question mark about December, but if I'm Jay Powell, so long as that labor market is tightening, so long as the um, uh, the, you know, we're generating 150 to 200,000 jobs. I think I keep tightening until I get to neutral. So uh, I think the Fed's going to be pretty resolute here. I think they want to be boring. I think they will be boring and pushing short-term rates up. And if the economy does slow down, we're going to be very close to inversion by next spring. So I, I think uh, a very flat yield curve by next spring. But David, shouldn't we be encouraged by the wage growth? We sit here talking so often after these reports about the lack of it. Here it is, a fairly strong number, strongest we've seen since, what, 2008, I believe. Is it yeah, sustainable, and why is it not a, an area for us to be focused on? David and then Diane, you can weigh in as well. We'll wrap up. Yeah, no, I, I I, I think, you know, it's just a sign of our diminished expectations. We've got the tightest labor market in 50 years. And in real terms, average hourly earnings are up pretty much exactly the same number as CPI inflation for last month. We've got no real gain in wages despite the tightest labor market in 50 years and a 10-year expansion. I think this is a sign of the weakness of labor in terms of getting wage gains rather than any strength. Diane? 
Absolutely. I agree with that. I mean, what we've seen is a major shift in the ability of workers to be able to negotiate wage increases relative to the past. Lots of reasons. Jackson Hole spent a lot of time on that. There's a cornucopia of reasons for it, but policies continue to move in that direction, which is going to, is part of the reason why we're not as excited when we see this, these numbers. We're like, great, we love it. You want good economic numbers, but there's still a shadow of their former selves. And I think that's what David's getting to. And that's where the undercurrent is. Talking to some Fed presidents recently, they've really been going about on about the dual economy still out there even within their own districts on how all the growth is really concentrated in a few key areas and in some rural areas still very much lagging.